Um, hello, everybody. Um, I just wanted to thank the Ehlers Danlos Society for developing and implementing Project ECHO. I've been involved with other ECHO talks, and I think this is a great method for education and um, good discussion about EDS and other connective tissue conditions. Again, my name is Melissa Russo, and I'm a high-risk obstetrician and clinical geneticist based in Providence, Rhode Island. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about family planning, anticipating and managing pregnancy complications with vascular EDS, or I'm gonna just call it VEDS. So we're gonna go over some topics and then really open up for questions. Um, we're gonna outline family planning and obstetric problems encountered by individuals with VEDS and discuss potential treatment options and management plans so you have tools to talk to your care provider. So one of the most common questions I get asked is, is it safe for me to have a baby with VEDS? And really, I just don't have a quick answer. There's a lot of things that really go into deciding this. It can be based on your mutation type with VEDS. We do know that potentially there's a milder um, disease presentation with null mutations versus protein altering mutations. However, that being said, it's really best to, do, to review your personal history and any complications, your family history with your doctors or your providers, talk about potential risks in pregnancy, and then go on to decide if this is the right thing for you to do. So why is pregnancy thought to be this high risk time? There are changes in the cardiovascular system and also hormonal changes. So the graph on the left is sort of showing all the changes that happen with your blood your blood volume and your heart's pumping harder, your heart rate goes up a little bit. All these things put a little bit more stress on the blood vessels. Also the hormones change during pregnancy, which we're gonna talk about. You have more estrogen, progesterone and oxytocin. Um, and we think that these things together maybe make the time in pregnancy and postpartum to be a higher risk time for some type of vascular event. So how are we doing as care providers talking to women? Um, there was a study done um, by the EDS Foundation and we're not doing well right now. Um, they looked at different types of EDS and specifically, of course, we're focusing on VEDS. 63% of women have been told by their providers not to conceive. And this is not surprising because our current um, guidelines basically state that pregnancy is contraindicated with VEDS. And um, right now we're working on gathering a lot more data to really say maybe we should change these guidelines that it's a high risk time potentially, but this is an individual dis decision that you should be making with your provider and not to say that this is contraindicated. Um, there are other pregnancy options that are available that it sounds like in this study, they didn't really, the providers did not bring up, which we're going to talk about a little bit, like um, in vitro fertilization or um, having somebody else carry the pregnancy or adoption. Um, so those are also options we're going to talk about. So other things that are just related to sexual health and contraception. Um, this is a field where we really have no information yet. Um, we do, based on expert opinion, tell people to avoid estrogens uh, and potentially high-dose um, progesterone, but we do think that the low-dose progesterone pills, progesterone implants, and IUDs are safe. Um, we do want to give people options, and then if somebody is having bleeding issues or other gynecological problems, then really it's talking with your provider on a one-on-one -on -one basis on what is the right type of medication to be used. Um, there's a great app that I, or a website here on the lower left called bedsider.org that sort of reviews all the different contraceptive options and how well they work. But again, this is something where um, we are still gathering information and we need to get some data behind what we're saying um, as experts. Because um, women, you know, want to safely plan a pregnancy, or sorry, individuals want to safely plan a, plan a pregnancy. And, um, we want to ensure that you're having a pregnancy once you've really, you know, planned for it. And so we want to give you options to be able to have sex with a partner and not have to worry about getting pregnant. So as we stated before, pregnancy, we think, is a higher risk time, potentially for a vascular event. Um, maternal death in the more recent literature is really 10 to 20 percent in pregnancy. 
uh, mostly secondary to some type of vascular rupture, but it can be due to hollow organ rupture. Other things that we sort of talk about as um, risks that can happen in pregnancy is preterm birth or preterm rupture of the membranes where the water breaks early. The uterus that holds the baby or the womb can actually rupture. Um, and hollow organs can also rupture during um, the time of pregnancy. There was a recent study that just came out um, mainly from Europe. Um, the ROPEC, which is where they sort of gathered information on lots and lots of pregnant persons who had um, thoracic aortic disease or vascular disease and then had a pregnancy in that they had four individuals with VEDS. None of them had adverse events in pregnancy and all four had cesarean sections. Um, with this, I mean, granted, this is a very, very small cohort, but you know, this is a little bit promising. And I think as we gather more and more of this data, which I'll show you at the end of the talk, hopefully we're gonna be able to amend those um, guidelines and say, you know, pregnancy can be a high risk time, here are the risks, and it's your choice whether or not to have a pregnancy. So talking about a pregnancy, I tell people to plan ahead, assemble your team, decide whether you wanna do testing in the pregnancy, and then we can talk about pregnancy management. So prior to getting pregnant, you want to make sure that any medications you're on that could affect the pregnancy are stopped and usually about six weeks before trying to get pregnant. One of the meds that um, some people can be on are the angiotensin receptin blockers or losartan and its um, cousins. Um, that is a medicine we want people to be off that six weeks before getting pregnant. Also, sometimes we wanna have some type of imaging prior to pregnancy. MRIs or MRAs are safe, but um, we do wanna avoid CT scans um, unless it's an emergency in pregnancy just because there is radiation. And then talking about just that the risk of the baby having the same condition, which I'm gonna talk about in the next slide. And then counseling, again, like we talked about, about risks that could happen in pregnancy and potential effects on long-term health, which we're not really sure of yet, but we think maybe that pregnancy, almost that experience or how the times you're pregnant could um, have an effect on the blood vessels. And we've already talked a little bit about contraceptive, contraceptives and that we don't have a lot of information, but I'm happy to try to answer questions. So with assembling your team, you wanna make sure that you're seen in a center that at least has heard of VEDS or is um, willing to learn. You want it to be sort of a major center where they have cardiothoracic surgery and then all of the players to sort of help take care of you in the pregnancy, which would be a high-risk doctor, cardiologist, cardiovascular surgeon, sometimes a geneticist, anesthesiologist, and then people to take care of the babies as long as uh, sorry, as well as all of the nurses, nursing leaders, planning, um, talking about simulation and what are we going to do if somebody shows up with some type of um, dissection symptoms and how to quickly take care of you and your pregnancy um, throughout the pregnancy. So really, we this is a whole team that takes care of you. Talking about genetic testing options, if we want to test the baby, that is possible, but you need to know your specific mutation um, to, in order to do this. With VEDS, we know this is an autosomal dominant condition in the CALL3A1 gene. And um, with that, the, the, every time you uh, go to have a baby, you have a 50-50 chance of passing this on to, the, to your child. This can be if the, the mom or the dad has VEDS. Um, there are different ways to test. So prior to um, putting the baby in the uterus, you can do in vitro fertilization and they can actually take a biopsy of the embryo, which is when the sperm and the egg come together and test that before putting it back in the uterus, which is 99% accurate. There can also be testing done during the pregnancy, which in the first trimester is chorionic villus sampling, where we can sample some of the placenta. And in the second trimester, we do something called an amniocentesis where we take some of the fluid from around the baby, like from the water sac. There's cells from the baby. We can take those cells, look at the DNA and sort of do genetic testing on the cells in that fluid. With each of these, there's a small risk of losing the pregnancy. It's about one in 300 with the chorionic villus sampling or CVS in the first trimester and one in three, sorry, one in a thousand um, in the second trimester with amniocentesis.
You can also do testing after the baby is here, which some people choose as well. During the pregnancy, we wanna just keep an eye on all the blood vessels. Um, the way we do that is by um, watching things with, we can do an echo, but that's really just looking at the root or the, the first part of the candy cane for the aorta and prefer to do some type of assessment of all of the blood vessels, which can be done safely in pregnancy with an MRI, or we call it an MRA, and we don't use contrast for that. Um, the other things we do recommend is a beta blocker if tolerated, um, which metoprolol is the one that we prefer. And that really is not decreasing blood pressure, but we use it to sort of decrease stress on the blood vessels. We also wanna watch the baby during pregnancy. So we recommend doing a detailed anatomy scan around 18 to 20 weeks, and then growth scans every four weeks in the third trimester. Um, there are some things we can find um, on ultrasound to know if the baby has vascular EDS. However, those things don't have to be there. Um, and so we can't really look at the ultrasound to know if a baby is affected. We also want to uh, talk with our anesthesiologist to make sure that it's safe to do um, regional anesthesia um, versus putting someone to sleep for the delivery. Um, things that they may want to have, they may want to have some imaging of the spine prior to doing these procedures. We do think it is relatively safe to do a regional um, anesthesia or the spinal or epidural, but we want to make sure that that is possible. Um, and imaging sort of helps make sure that there's not any of these outpouchings, which are called duralectasia, which can just make the medicine pool and not work as well, and make sure there's no blood vessels that are different and, and not necessarily uh, there. For delivery recommendations, I think here in the United States and in Europe and uh, throughout, we now think that, um, and throughout the world, uh, we think that the best way to deliver women with VEDS is um, a cesarean delivery or a C-section. Why do we think this? It's sort of a twofold. We think, you know, most women have some type of a tear in the vagina with their first um, vaginal delivery. And um, with VEDS, that can be really, really hard to repair and can cause a lot of bleeding. Um, and secondly, we know that when the uterus is contracting in labor, that potentially the uterus could open or rupture, which could be catastrophic for mom or the baby. And so that's why we recommend a C-section and we do it a little bit early to try to prevent um, labor from happening um, prior to the delivery. There has been some case reports out there where they talk about one or two patients that have used DDAVP um, to prevent bleeding or something called transexamic acid. There's not really great data to say this is helpful. Um, it's not harmful, but we just don't know yet if that is really something that's needed. And just talking to my vascular surgery colleagues, they don't necessarily pre-medicate people prior to surgery as well. So, Postpartum is also a time where um, there could be some type of a vascular event. Um, and so we do want to watch people closely for the first two to three days after delivery. And we want to do imaging. Um, again, the echocardiogram is not really as helpful, but some type of imaging, either a CT scan or MRI, usually before somebody leaves the hospital and then at three to six months postpartum, just to make sure that everything is still looking okay. And then there's some um, really interesting and exciting new data that's come out um, that I just wanted to talk about briefly uh, in terms of breastfeeding or chest feeding and the potential risks. So um, Caitlin Bowen and Hal Dietz's group at Johns Hopkins have uh, published this recent data where they had a, um, a mouse model um, of VEDS. Um, they've showed this before in a Marfan mouse model, but now they have data on the VEDS mouse model as well that's sort of showing the same thing. And really to explain to you what these graphs mean is when the, the mice sort of have their babies, if the pups are taken away and they stop sort of uh, feeding the pups or nursing the pups, then they actually don't dissect versus if you leave them together, then a lot of them dissect. And they sort of tease this out. So oxytocin is a hormone that's released from the brain. It sort of helps with milk let down. And um, we think that oxytocin, which sort of goes up during pregnancy and stays elevated if you decide to breastfeed, 
um, may be involved or it is involved in the mouse pathway that sort of causes these dissection risks. So with that, you know, when they take the pups away or they block this oxytocin receptor, then these mice are sort of saved from that dissection risk. Um, they also looked at propranolol and found that that really did not help the mice. Um, hydralazine was found to help the mice, but that is not a medicine we're typically using in pregnancy yet because there's just a lot of fluctuations with the blood pressure. But, you know, that may be something as more studies come out that we could use potentially. Um, but I guess the important thing is, is just to know that in mice, it seems like that this oxytocin um, is associated with this vascular risk, but we don't really yet have information in humans to say that this is the same thing. Um, there are ongoing studies to really look at this further, but this is a potential risk that I do tell my patients about. I do, do not tell them to not breastfeed um, or chest feed, but um, I talk to them about the mouse studies and sort of let them make their own decisions. And I'm happy to answer more questions about that. In terms of becoming a parent, there are many, many paths. Some people choose to have children the traditional way with a, a pregnancy. Some people use a gestational carrier or surrogate where somebody else carries your genetically, um, your genetic baby, or you could have them carry somebody like other, other person's uh, genetic information or genetic uh, child. Um, adoption is an option, and some people choose just to have pets and plants as parents. So um, there are lots of different routes that you should think about and um, talk about with your own care provider to figure out the right choice for you. So I just went through a lot of stuff quickly because I really want to get to questions and answers, but um, we talked about all the risks, but I do want to tell you that you can have a healthy baby with if you have vets. So I don't want this to sort of uh, ruin or crush all your hope. Um, Crystal Nichols was um, a very special person and she did a lot with the Ehlers-Danlos Society. Um, she had pregnancies. Um, I have a picture here of a patient of mine who with permission, let me post her child. Um, so really, I think following the steps of assembling your team, figuring out if you want to test, being followed through pregnancy, if you do all of those things, you can have a, a safe and healthy pregnancy. And it's just um, knowing the risks before you go into it is really important and working with the right team. So um, in summary, we talked about contraception and family planning research that we still have a long way to go. And you should work with your care providers to sort of help you with these issues. Um, in terms of obstetrics research, there are many studies currently underway, and we're going to have more data in the next year or two to really help, I think, guide this a little bit more um, and potentially revise our national guidelines. And just to tell you about some of the studies that are out there, um, the VEDS Collaborative is available, and I'm sure they have information um, at, in one of these talks of how to get enrolled if you wanted to be involved in that research project. Um, I'm working with a bunch of other centers to sort of gather pregnancy and reproductive outcomes where we're looking at contraception, pregnancy, and other things sort of related to pregnancy. And then a third project I have with one of my students um, is looking at people's sort of mental health during pregnancy. So um, just keep a lookout for all of these studies. So now I wanted to just... Um, get to questions. I'm ha happy to answer anything. There are no stupid questions. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you all for listening.